I, well, I, there's a long process, uh, and I think that it was what they call the School of Hard Knocks, and I graduated with a, a degree in American Studies, but if you deconstructed that degree, it was a, a degree in Cultural Marxism, and I entered from the theoretical world, the college realm, academia, into a place where my dad said uh, to my chagrin that I had to get a real job. And when I started to work for other people, um, it became very difficult for me to justify my attitude, which was that the employer owed me the job. And I realized the only way that I would be able to move from point A to point B and to pay for not just my rent, which was a foreign concept, but to have to pay for my shoes was to actually have to have a skill and work very hard. And once I started to do that, I started to get this thing that they think that children should get in kindergarten with their first set of books, and that was self-esteem. You get self-esteem just for showing up. You get self-esteem for being gay, straight, or whatever. You get self-esteem for being you know, black, Hispanic, whatever. That's how they're teaching people in the schools these days. And I realized, hmm, first place I got real self-esteem was paying for my shoes. And that's how I, I did it. And, and I started to listen to talk radio. And I started to have radio professors on the AM dial, like Rush Limbaugh and Dennis Prager. And they were the antidote to my college pr professors who were nihilists. And so I became a conservative over a very uh, important group of years, uh, probably 1991 to 1996 when I voted for my first Republican, uh, Bob Dole. Uh, the Democrat media complex is the natural alliance of the mainstream media, the Democratic Party, and liberal interest groups. And I first witnessed the Democrat media complex, which is like The Matrix, in the movie The Matrix with Keanu Reeves and Lawrence Fishburne. I recognized The Matrix in 1991. I didn't know what it was, but I recognized it the first time during the Clarence Thomas uh, hearings. And that was when ABC, CBS, NBC, the New York Times, and the Washington Post chose to put Clarence Thomas on the hot seat and allowed for Caucasian white powerful senators to judge a black, the second black the potentially second black Supreme Court justice. And I didn't understand why the NAACP and other black civil rights groups weren't stepping up to defend him, which seemed like it would be the natural thing. And I didn't understand why the mainstream newspapers and the mainstream press, including CNN, uh, presupposed his guilt. And when I saw that Ted Kennedy, the Ted Kennedy, was sitting in judgment, uh, against Ted Kennedy and that which they were accusing him of if proved true was nothing compared to what Ted Kennedy does before breakfast as relates to women in, in his proximity that he's not married to. So the hypocrisy just was ringing out and I, I thought to myself what is this? How is it that the press and the Democratic Party can act together with the aiding and abetting of the NAACP, a liberal activist group, in order to craft a massive narrative, one that manifested itself in bumper stickers and, and, uh, and books and the mythology that just carried the day. And I watched the hearings. I wanted Clarence Thomas, as then a default liberal, to be taken down. And I watched the hearings, and by the very end of those hearings, I realized that there was something wrong here. And when did this start? I would argue that it started in the 1940s and the 1950s and that Marxists had infiltrated our government in many ways. There was an intentional infusion of communists into government, into the army, into the State Department. But the most effective intruders happen in the cultural realm, and I write about it in Hollywood, in, in uh, Righteous Indignation, the Frankfurt School, Antonio Gramsci, Herbert Marcuse, uh, 
Theodore Adorno, a bunch of these guys came to America and they came from a mindset that translated Marxism uh, from economic terms into cultural terms. And Gramsci believed in this concept of gradualism as opposed to thinking that you could have a revolution like Che Guevara going into Cuba. Instead of having a revolution in America that they would have to have a long march through the institutions and those institutions are academia, the mainstream media, uh, and Hollywood. And I would say that from the 1940s and the 1950s there has not only been a concerted effort for a cultural push through those institutions, I would say that conservatives who have focused mostly on politics uh, never challenged that long march through the institutions and so for the last 60 to 70 years the left without uh, a counterattack without an attempt to push back has allowed for the culture to be completely taken over by a left of center mindset and I would argue that the majority at ABC, CBS, and NBC and the majority in the humanities departments uh, don't even understand why they believe the way that they believe. And I helped create the Huffington Post and I can tell you it was their intent to create yet another ring uh, in the concentric circles that constitute the mainstream media and it's almost an endless series of rings but I felt that it was necessary uh, for a stated and avowed leftist site to exist that would challenge the New York Times which never admitted that it was a leftist vessel projecting itself as objective news and I think that the Huffington Post has been one of the most incredible vehicles to expose just how liberal and left of center Pinch Sulzberger's New York Times is. And now I think that the left is now having to grapple with the fact that they've been exposed, that the New York Times has the exact same political DNA on its front page and in its news section as the Huffington Post an avowed left of center site, which has the same exact DNA as Media Matters and other George Soros, John Podesta run organizations. And so right now we are moving less towards, uh, we are moving away from a false order that has existed for the last 60 to 70 years and that is the fake objective media. There never was objective media. It was left of center media that was crafted as a form of propaganda to tell the people at home through CBS, ABC, NBC, Walter Cronkite being a perfect example, we're just giving you the facts. That couldn't be further from the truth and being at the Lincoln, <laughs> I mean being at the Lincoln, being at the Nixon Library, I think that uh, Richard Nixon to a huge extent understood that he was under assault from day one, you know, that Woodward and Bernstein, uh, you know, were 100% motivated to get a scalp that hap happened to be a Republican. And I don't think that Woodward and Bernstein would go as hard after Nixon if he had been a Democrat. In fact, from what I've known about investigative journalists, is that they are part of the aiding and abetting of the cover-ups of scandals that go against the Democratic Party. We are now moving towards a place where we have left of center websites, we have right of center websites. It doesn't mean that Woodward and Bernstein aren't going to have a scalp, that they're not going to have a future uh, Watergate. It's that we now know that the reason why they felt so compelled to go after that uh, story was there was politics behind it and I'm totally comfortable with that. I'm comfortable with a more transparent media because very few people can come to a story, can come to politics uh, as a straight stenographer. Most people are biased and are motivated to expose things. Well, right now we're in, in the beginning of the primary season. I'd say two people who are showing 
how it can be done in the new media era as politicians. You have Chris Christie, uh, who claims that he's not, you know, thinking about running for the presidency, and then you have Herman Cain, who is in fact running for the presidency, probably longer than anyone else. And uh, from the Herman Cain stance, you have a guy who has Ronald Reagan's strategy, and that is he's a happy warrior, and he is able to. He knows who the press is. Herman Cain knows that they don't want him to be the president. Herman Cain knows that they especially hate the narrative of a black conservative. And that's why that left and the media wanted to destroy uh, Clarence Thomas. And so he's playing the Reagan role of being the happy warrior and smiling and being charming. But he's able to get his message out there. He has a strong conservative message behind that. And I think you can always be that. I, can, I think you can be jocular and firm and talk around or over the media. Or you can be a little bit more smash mouth in your approach like Governor Christie is. And I think that the reason why the electorate uh, so desires or the, so many people who are conservatives want Governor Christie to run isn't because he's conservative, because nobody really knows where he stands on all these issues, and some would argue that he's not conservative enough. But what they like is the confrontational man manner that he has with those people out there for, who, for the longest time, have been protected by the mainstream media. He goes after the unions. Um, when the, the press asks him tough questions, he answers them, the questions, in a very tough way. I think people, you know, appreciate people like Chris Christie who, who don't defer to the media, don't defer to their bias, and challenge them. And I think that you can see in Newt Gingrich in the last few debates, he's challenged the media, and that gets a lot of traction. And so if you look at the polls, you look at Gallup polls, people distrust the media more than they distrust Congress, and Congress has world-class historical lows. It's like in the 30s, maybe the 20s, maybe even the teens. People don't trust the media. And so I think that the politicians, especially conservative ones, need to be incredibly aggressive, not just against their political foes, but their foes in the media. I grew up on the west side of Los Angeles where the only union presence was SAG and the Writers Guild and the Directors Guild. And I wouldn't say that this is your typical on the waterfront, uh, other than the fact that it was, you know, uh, that it was Hollywood and it was made in Hollywood on the waterfront. But I don't come to my politics with a prejudice against unions. Um, I've just always assumed that unions were a necessary means to an end. Um, but as I've been on the road going to tea parties around the country over the last few years, uh, a movement that I've supported, a movement that I've defended against false accusations of violence and racism that have never you know, manifested themselves, certainly on the stages where the speakers talk and certainly not in the audiences where the people clean up after themselves, and from city to city, I found myself walking into Tea Party events, whether they be in arenas such as in northern suburbs of Chicago uh, in 2010, or whether it be you know, on, on the outskirts of a, a Tea Party in Arizona, I found myself confronted by, or, or, or most notably, in Searchlight, Nevada, uh, in early 2010, I'd been confronted by unions dressed in union garb, organized by either Organizing for America, formerly Obama for America, or by the Democratic Party itself. So you have unions acting as astroturf protest against tea parties, uh, against tea parties. And I've watched them uh, be rude, violent um, and, uh, and, and quite frankly trying to start and agitate something with these peaceful protesters who are simply asking for limited government, 
less taxes, more government accountability, yet the unions are threatened by this group at such a level that they're testing the power of the Edmonds decision and they're attacking people. They're coordinating with the Democratic Party to attack people. And so in the last two years, this light-hearted guy from West Los Angeles has said, these are bullies, Richard Trumka, Jimmy Hoffa, speaking in the language of violence, acting caught on tape on vi violence, attacking people, I'm standing up against it, and I was asked about said violence at an event in Lexington, Massachusetts, and I said they're pushing people so hard, and if the lawlessness is going to be met with no Justice Department arrests, especially when it gets to the point in Washington State where unions protesting against an, a, a company took people hostage and nobody was arrested. At a certain point, the lawlessness of it all, the lack of the uh, rule of law being honored, puts the American people in a position where if they're attacked, they're gonna have to attack back. That was my point.